Good morning, everyone. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here, and I wanted to thank Yozu and uh, uh, the Stimula Project for inviting me. Uh, I was extremely impressed by the city of Saragossa. I've never been here before, and it is really uh, a place I would like us to all move. <laughs> if, if the commission is patient, stationed here, it would have been a much nicer uh, location in terms of uh, not only history, but also just the way people are able to walk, uh, which is impossible in Brussels, actually, and uh, the sunshine. Anyway, uh, I would like today to mention, uh, to talk about a little bit about the work that um, uh, the Directorate General on Education and Culture, in especially our unit, is trying to do is to uh, help uh, deliver to the member states some sort of guidance in terms of um, what they could choose to do uh, for improvement of uh, um, achievement of math and science. It's both. And the key word is basic. We're not talking about um, trying to train scientists. We are looking at uh, the basic skills as they are defined by PISA. So, well, let me, and please feel free to interrupt me at any moment, and if you ask, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, because as a f former university teacher, I really appreciate when there is a more of a two-way communication rather than monologue. Anyway, uh, these are the main challenges uh, as identified, uh, and of course, we all know uh, those issues. Uh, as uh, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, mentioned uh, the way the, the narrative goes these days is that education is a key to economic growth. Whether this is really the case, we're not going to go into, uh, but the report that um, one of the reports uh, estimated that if we are to lower the Mm, performance of 15 year olds, which is right now above, um, well, let me show you the figures. Uh, we are looking at uh, 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 the students below PISA 2 level, and they are um, pretty high, I mean, more than one fifth of the, of the young Europeans at the age of 15 cannot. Uh, perform at uh, level two as, uh, mm, uh, as measured by the Program for International Student Assessment, PISA. Things have been improving, as you can see, but still not very, uh, not as well as we would like it to do. So you can see the figures are staggering. We're talking about 21 trillion euros, possibly being generated if we lower those figures to 15 and below. And 87 trillion by 2090, of course. These are all kind of future scenarios which may or may not um, uh, be correct. One thing that people often forget is that when we have a democratic society, unless people are scientifically literate, and it me does not mean that they have to know what a molecule is, what they really need is the way of thinking, the way of questioning, because science, by, defin by the definition uh, most uh, scientists uh, agree with, is not a heap of knowledge, facts, or theories for that matter. It is a way of thinking. The willingness to discard your own uh, beliefs in, when faced with experimental evidence. And most people are not inclined to do that, and I'll mention this a little bit later. So, uh, we, we are looking at an essential tool uh, for functioning of, uh, of uh, modern societies. It was not the case before, let's say maybe 100 years ago, but today when the technology is rushing into our lives uh, big time, uh, because I worked before in the um, Directorate of, of Health and uh, consumers, and I know how people are afraid. They are afraid of changing the light bulbs from uh, normal to 
you know, this light, uh, the energy saving light bulb, they think, oh, this is terrible, or the mobile phones, they make you cancer, you know, all this nonsense which is out there. Uh, but so what is the European Union response to the situation of one fifth of our young 15 year olds not being able to read and write and to communicate and to understand science as, uh, as a process? Uh, there were several council conclusions, the ministers of education, and uh, the most important one was of May 2009, when the benchmark of below 15% was adopted. So it was the goal is to be below 15% by the uh, by year 2020. Um, so based on this, I mean, and, and this council is uh, uh, delivered the mandate for the creation of the so-called thematic working group. Uh, uh, on maths and science uh, and technology. You can see here MST, this is how it was worded. But however, I wanted to point out that it, technology was dropped from the work of, uh, of the thematic working group for two reasons. First of all, there is no well established, widely accepted definition of what technology is. And then PISA does not measure technology, te awareness of technology. technology today is considered by philosophers of science to be basically the same as science. I mean, science and technology are fused together. They are no longer separate the way they were uh, 100 or 150 years ago. Because today, you cannot just sit in your kitchen and create scientific, uh, I mean, discover scientific facts. Uh, you need a lot of money and support. So the idea is to deliver um, a report. Now, what are the tools? I mean, and again, this no T means no technology. <laughs> will be considered. Uh, the tools, uh, the way the working group works is to, through peer learning. Uh, so we have uh, experts from member states, from different countries, and as I mentioned, even from different regions. For example, in Pisa, we have, as I mentioned to Yozo yesterday, we have a separation between Dutch speakers, uh, Dutch speaking community of Belgium and French-speaking community. They have completely different uh, approach to education and they are presented in PISA with their own uh, uh, data. Uh, China, of course, is also not a huge country, so we have, they have Shanghai, China Shanghai is representing PISA. Whether it represents the whole of China, of course, it's a, another question. But uh, the issue is, oh. Okay, sorry. Well, I'm, as I said, I'm used to moving around. If I sit, I cannot talk. Um, and actually, I work actually standing, too. As they say, <laughs> standing is the new smoke. I mean, sitting is the new smoking. Uh, the, uh, uh, so we are talking about visiting places, discussing, observing, sharing experiences. Uh, also, experts' presentations. Uh, uh, we, uh, the discussion went on within the group itself. Most importantly, the group is looking at evidence. You cannot just say, okay, well, these policies work. Well, do they? What is the evidence for that? Do we have a randomized controlled trial to show that? And it's very difficult, of course, in the social sciences to do that. It's not like when you have a pharmaceutical, you can know exactly what happens. But here, uh, we're talking about an intervention, a, pol a policy, and uh, it is harder to, mm, uh, uh, to do that. So what are the factors for low of achievement in maths and science? So what, uh, that is what LAMS means, <laughs> low achievement in maths and science. There is no news here. I'm sure you were all aware, social economic background, and the important thing for uh, us was not to look at students in general who are not performing well, because there are students who suffer from disabilities, physical or cognitive disabilities, they're so-called uh, special ed or special education students. Uh, no, we're looking at students who do not suffer from those, but still lag behind the rest. And the reasons for that are, uh, um, are possible to alleviate. In other words, they, they, there is an educational tool that will help them um, uh, um, 
overcome their family background, which is the most important factor, or let's say migrants, uh, migrant uh, populations also tend to be uh, uh, in this group of low achievers for no apparent reason, no inherent reason. Who early school leavers, uh, so we are, um, so it's kind of an overlap, but they, there is some overlap between all of these uh, categories of students. However, there we, we are looking at those who are um, uh, uh, who are still um, subject to intervention from an educational policy perspective. And I wanted to point out that stimula is interested in pedagogical approaches. With this is not mm, this is not what the working group is doing. So Comenius program funds uh, uh, stimula and other projects uh, that look at more of a kind of a field work. The thematic working group's aim is to try to find the policies that are kind of the policies from, um, from a larger, from a bigger perspective that may or may not help. Interestingly, uh, the gender factor was, uh, the data, show, uh, data show that uh, gender does not play a role in maths and science at the level of basic skills. We're not talking about how many women are in the top tier of universities, uh, uh, research laboratories. No, we're looking at basic skills. And there, um, it used to be that boys were outperforming girls, but it's no longer the case. And uh, there is no, the differences are one or two percentage points. In fact, girls are outperforming boys in, uh, in science and in basic skills in science, which is linked perhaps to their huge under, uh, uh, overperformance over boys uh, in literacy, which is more, more than a year, I think, according. But we're not looking at literacy now. So what are these policies that we are trying to make? And I, I wanted to, make, uh, to also uh, emphasize that what I'm saying here is not, has not been approved by the working group and it is still under discussion any suggestions on your part, any ideas, any corrections will be much appreciated. It's only a draft. The <clears throat> so the first thing is that in many countries, and I cannot, I mean, I can give you some data about this specifically, but some countries do not even include science as a basic skill, which may be justified because if you look at it, the basic skills are literacy and numeracy. And science uh, understanding and being able to think scientifically, it comes like a, it's built upon uh, this uh, certain basic skill level of literacy and, uh, uh, and numeracy. However, as I mentioned in, uh, in the beginning, in today's, it may have been the case, okay, this was, these were the basic skills, let's say, 100 years ago, and it was enough to be integrated in the society and to do very well. In fact, in 1900, in the United States, only 10% of the population was finishing high school. And these were the people who were considered the, you know, cream of the society, 10%. Today, we're talking about 80% uh, or something, and then, uh, and then uh, the number of people who graduate from college is even, uh, um, has also increased dramatically. So, in today's world, it, is, it has become essential to understand um, science. That's why one of the policies is to be able to change, to include among a member states um, science as a, uh, as a basic skill. And one thing I wanted to emphasize here that the scientific way of thinking, another reason for that is because the scientific way of thinking it does not come naturally to human beings. They, Psychologically, I mean, evolutionary psychology has shown that humans are not inclined to challenge their biases or their uh, pre, uh, mm, they don't, they are not inclined to use logic or uh, let's say to follow logical argument or deductive reasoning for that matter. Uh, these are, it requires special effort and only education could, uh, could help uh, in that sense. And uh, another thing is also that I mentioned earlier is the fact uh, as Anne Clover, who was the um, science advisor to President Barroso, mentioned in several of her writings that uh, the biggest obstacle for Europe's innovation and economic growth is actually the culture of fear. The average Europeans, unlike 
the Americans or the Asians or Latin Americans for that matter, uh, Europeans are just too squirmish when they hear something like GMO or mobile phones, as I said, you know, or uh, let's say fracking, they just don't know. They say just no, and they don't want to hear to any, to, they do not to, to, to even <laughs> consider <laughs> logical argumentation in this case. Mm, so this is what's considered now a big issue uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, in the context of uh, science education. Uh, another topic is something, this is exactly what Stimula is doing, I feel, is to, when we're talking about the field work, uh, teaching science in context, uh, linking it to, uh, to vocational and uh, uh, vocational training, uh, and just making a link with real life, with uh, industry, with the services. It's science is everywhere. Uh, you cannot function in the society, but you have to, but it's the way it is taught in normally in school is out of context. It's like ideas, theoretical uh, concepts, and um, the context is uh, helping low achieving understand and get hooked on science. We don't really need everyone to be a scientist. It's not possible and it's not even uh, uh, financially, economically feasible. But the word appreciation, just like we teach art appreciation, not everybody can draw but everybody can appreciate art, and the same thing could be said about science, because it is a very special way of thinking which does not come to everyone so easily. In fact, I remember the president of the National Association of uh, uh, Teachers, Science Teachers in the US has written that we all know that it's futile to try to instill the scientific way of thinking of people who are not, who are not science majors, so to speak. Well, okay, well, they will never become scientists. This is fine, but at least let them appreciate science and not be afraid of it. <clears throat> um, another issue is that a lot, of, uh, mm, a lot of member states' culture thinks that what I just said, okay, well, if you do not, uh, you're just not good at science, you're not good at math, and, but we're talking about basic skills. We're not talking about becoming a scientist, this is one thing. But it's another thing to be able to master the level of two on PISA, which is pretty low. And this concept that everybody can do it, that less actually than 10% uh, can uh, um, uh, master uh, could, could be less than 10% could be the so-called low achievers instead of 20 right now. It is shown in some countries, for example, countries have improved significantly since the, uh, two th I mean, they were 2006, 2009 piece, and there is another one coming out this year, the end of this year. <coughs> and Italy, Poland, Portugal, uh, Latvia and Romania, they all improved significantly. Uh, and even there are countries like uh, uh, Finland, Estonia, and the Netherlands who are already at this benchmark of uh, 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 less than 15, and they are actually less than 10, they are about 10. So the argument of the working group was then, well, if they can do it, everybody should be able to do it. <clears throat> and in science, we already have quite a, of quite a few countries that are already at this level below 15. Uh, Germany, Hungary, Latvia, Poland, Slovenia, and the UK. Um, another, so, so what I wanted to say is that uh, policies have to be, uh, uh, have to promote this, that it is possible to do, not, not to throw the towel and decide, okay, well, in my region I cannot do it. Certainly, Motivating because teachers are the essential component here and unless they're motivated to address the issues of basic skills, the issues of, uh, of the low achievers, nothing would work. And expectations, my, 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 my wife just started teaching at the European school in Brussels, one of the European schools in Brussels. And she's just horrified the way teachers are being, they're not even informed about issues, they are just, the disorganization and everything, it's, it's incredible. 
Uh, and I can see how people expect a lot of the teachers, but at the same time, they do not supply support for the teachers. Um, another policy could be if uh, the low achievement in maths and science is put at the center of the policy agenda. Uh, in other words, like um, literacy is mainstreamed and it could be the same thing could be said about uh, maths and science. In other words, mainstreamed in every subject could be covered. Uh, and also regions uh, and countries should participate in those um, PISA and, uh, and teams and others. So monitoring is another policy which is self Evident, without monitoring where we are, there is no way we can do anything about it. And the most important, of course, is expertise in tackling low achievement. Because if teachers say, okay, well, I'm not going to deal with, this, uh, with those kids because they're no good anyway, I'm not going to be able to, but if they believe they can do something, and if they are being supported to, uh, with, uh, uh, with training, and it applies to, on one hand to all the teachers and on the other hand to teachers who are specialists, specialists in dealing uh, with uh, low achievement. So there are two groups. And after we have the monitoring, we have to, of course, identify the students using many, I mean, the group went to the way different countries do it. And every country can do it their own way or every region for that matter, once it, uh, then uh, the action should be taken fast and very intensively. Most importantly, the support is supposed, to, is supposed to be integrated in the school hours. In other words, not to pull out the kids from the classroom and put them in another classroom or uh, after, the, uh, after everybody has gone home or let's now, now let's have uh, one extra hour. The, the issue is that there is no clear cut. Okay, here are the low achievers, here are the normal kids, normally in quotation marks. No, everyone is low achieving at one point. Or today is not my day and I didn't do well and I did not understand what they were saying. So it's a continuum from one range when we have people with cognitive and physical disabilities like uh, special ed students. And then on the other hand, you have, you know, brilliant kids. But in the middle, but every single one of these, uh, of these students will need support sooner or later <laughs> during her or, or his uh, schooling. This support is supposed to be to start even, the child, even before the child has been born, prenatal, <laughs> and then continues on through kindergarten and uh, from zero, as we say. And that's important, especially because we know that the factor for low achievement is family background. So family background is, is eliminated as a factor if we have early, um, early intervention. Most importantly, which is something very controversial, and are we teaching them what they call social-emotional literacy, <laughs> because we all know that if emotions take over, there's no way a child could be taught anything. Um, they are I mean, these are the issues uh, that um, we all know uh, contribute to low achievement. And they have precious little to do with, um, uh, with the, uh, the ability of the, of the, of the child to, uh, to, to learn. And here is a quote by John Dewey, who is an American um, educator from the 19th century, that teaching, is, I mean, education is not about economic growth only. Because I think there is too much, personally, I feel there is too much emphasis into that direction. Education is also about, as he pulls it, plasticity. In other words, the ability to adapt, to change as time goes by. And interdependence, communication with your, uh, with your uh, peers, being able to uh, enjoy the interaction with, the, I mean, <laughs> Finland is on the top of the, of the uh, education league in the world, but I remember I read somewhere that their military conscripts, when they came at the age of 18, they were sent back. They said, okay, you go back and now learn how to communicate because they never learned. I mean, they know they, they're good at science, they're good at math, but they have absolutely no 
communication skills. Why is it so? Because they all sit on their little gadgets 90% 90, 90 of the time, communicating through online and uh, not being able to learn. And, and uh, a couple of um, mm, other things, of course, parental involvement is a policy. For example, in Ireland, there is this program that assigns a teacher from the school who does not teach classroom teaching, and he or she goes and does only that. Relates, goes and, okay, well, let us see this family. Do they know anything about maths and science? Are they pulling back their child from being able to succeed, which is usually the case if, the, if they come from a migrant family, they don't speak the language, in, in, and for example, they even translate in the native tongue of the migrants the books on maths and science, so they can at least know the language and they could help their child. So this program is very interesting in Ireland, it certainly works. Uh, uh, the idea of uh, the pedagogy, which of course is student-centered, uh, computer-enabled, it works much easier for maths and science, for science, so to speak, than for other subjects, because it's science lends itself to that. Networking between teachers and uh, between schools on lower achievement issues. And of course, addressing the economic disparities, these are all the issues uh, that I mentioned, and the fact that we need to look at policies that have been shown that work. Now, now we'll look, uh, uh, I'll just uh, mention a couple of other policies that are not necessarily aimed at low achieving students, but also general achievement that will be, that help. It was already mentioned the mainstreaming of literacy, of, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, math, math numeracy, the way literacy is mainstreamed. Setting standards for science, which are absent in many countries, and most importantly, support for teachers. Networking between teachers, co-teaching in the classroom, like team teaching, collaboration, uh, those are training, pay, prestige. If we don't have that, the teachers will never be able to deliver what we expect them to. Um, change of, of the assessment practices when students are part of the assessment they feel ownership of what they're doing they they don't feel like oh well they, we are being tested so that they could be put in this group or that group no if the test itself is given with the idea for the student himself or herself to evaluate her own progress without any consequences that is uh, what they call, you know, formative uh, 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 assessment, which may work better. And one thing which is very important, for example, this is why I put it here, emphasized, in Finland, which I said was the top performer, the key terms are equity and cooperation. In the United States, the key terms are choice and competition. The, and of course, again, if the reforms are coming from the bottom, if you include the holistic approach, because none of these would work unless not only educational policies, but also social policies, uh, public health policies, economic policies, all work in tandem together. That's in the political will to um, to implement them. At this point, we are short on recommendation. I just listed what we have discovered, what the working group has discovered, and the next step is to try to provide um, member states with country-specific advice, both at school level, uh, you know, regional or national level, depending on the country. For example, in, in Germany and I think maybe in Spain and in, in, is in, uh, in Belgium, uh, the regions have a lot of autonomy in terms of how they run their own education system. And then at the EU level. <clears throat> uh, the reason 
it is listed like this is because studies have shown that the differences between countries in, on PISA results are really linked not so much, I mean, only 10% could be explained with differences between countries. More than half of the differences on the PISA uh, outcomes are explained through um, differences between schools. In other words, you have excellent schools. I mean, Bulgaria is I mean, where I come from. It's on the bottom now. It used to be on the top <laughs> back in the 90s before the fall of communism, which tells you that all the political changes have actually swept away the traditional way of looking at education. And, uh, and so in other words, it could be much better, but there were political reasons and economic reasons why it went now to the bottom. And uh, 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 so, but there are still schools there that perform better than the Finnish schools or the Dutch schools for that matter. <coughs> Depends on what you compare with. So, um, it's a complicated, very, very difficult to, dis to decipher um, mm, um, mm, a picture. And that's why, the, as I said, the next goal is, uh, the next step is try to come up with recommendations, waiting for the PISA results coming in the beginning of uh, December, analyzing those results, what have changed since the last three years, since 2009, and also uh, we, uh, together with the, uh, we, uh, we are also looking at, uh, uh, we have commissioned a study uh, uh, to um, look at policies, national policies on tackling uh, low achievement in basic skills. After this study is delivered in the beginning of next year, we will deliver a basic skills report which includes math, science and reading and writing so that Member states will get, as I said, country-specific or region-specific advice. And this is only an advice. You know, the European Commission has absolutely no competence to do anything. Everything is in the hands of the member states. And those policies that I just listed, uh, they are not prescriptive. They are not to be borrowed. They are to be simply considered, adapted, depending on the cultural a specificity of the region, the country, whatever. Okay, anyway, nobody interrupted me, so any questions now? Thank you very much, Vladimir. Uh, we have time for some questions. Thank you for your explanations, Vladimir. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, when the Commission talks about basic skills in science, uh, what is uh, really measuring? Is it uh, basically knowledge or also values, talking about science and technology, uh, values like uh, critical uh, attitudes, for instance, and also, uh, or does it also measure methods, how research happens, what's the methodological uh, system, or is it a measure of everything? Very good question, thank you. Uh, the commission doesn't, I mean, our, the, the working group, as I said, it is, uh, the Commission only coordinates <laughs> and provides the platform for the member states to, uh, uh, and we follow their, guide, their uh, thinking. So the, com the working group decided to look at, uh, to define um, the basic skills at the level, as I said, PISA 2. And PISA 2, and if you permit me, I could quote this. Um, uh, students have adequate scientific knowledge to provide possible explanations in familiar contexts or draw conclusions based on simple investigation. So it is a process. They're looking at the process. Yes, you may have some, you have to have certain scientific knowledge. In other words, you have to be familiar with the language of science because it is foreign language. I mean, nobody uses in every, everyday discussions, words like molecules and atoms, but uh, 
the idea is really to see if the students can draw conclusions from given data. Here is the experimental data now. What is your conclusion? This is what we are looking at, and this is what PISA is trying to measure. And they do it in a random fashion. This is why it's such a powerful tool. Because they don't go into your, into your school and let's say, okay, now I would like to check, and you tell me whom to check. No. It's randomly, you can get a kid with special education needs and a kid with, who is brilliant, you know, this type of thing. So, um, the, uh, they, so uh, they continue here, they're capable of direct reasoning. So again, we're measuring the reasoning ability and making literal interpretation of the results of scientific inquiry or technological problem solving. This is the idea. But they are not looking at the values, as you mentioned. We are not looking, I mean, the, the PISA uh, investigation is not looking at, well, what is your attitude towards science? No. This is not part of the stimulus. What stimulus is doing, they are trying to see those attitudes so that they could change those attitudes because it helps students achieve better. But this is a tool. You see, PISA is not measuring the tool. PISA is measuring the result of the usage of the tool. Vladimir, can I ask just about the, the, sometimes we can get lost in acronyms, whether it be STEM, whether it be STEAM, whether it be MST. Uh, and I just made a note that you had said that you dropped the T. And, and these are, these cause many ar discussions and, and arguments and so forth and so on. And I just wanted to clarify in my mind as to whether or not, uh, you know, the, the T for was the STEM was still valid because in the UK, uh, that's what we use. Um, and we talk about the integrated approach, which you referred to, and we talk about the project-driven uh, approach. In other words, the application of scientific knowledge to the solving of technological problems. So I was just wondering whether or not that was still valid in the European... Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, absolutely, um, we still use STEM. <laughs> and my job description lists them, <laughs> as, uh, so it is, but, uh, but as you rightly said, technology is a powerful tool, even though, I mean, uh, and I, I think I mentioned that today, in today's world, in today's understanding and history of science, I mean, technology and science were separated 200 years ago, yes. But as they say, Marie Curie was the last, perhaps, um, scientist, sci sci a true scientist who was driven by curiosity. Today, science is not driven by curiosity, unfortunately, because it has grown, it has grown to an industry, and industry is driven by money, by postdocs, by equipment, by millions of, grand, uh, millions of pounds or dollars in grants. Uh, so you cannot just... In other words, there is a fusion. Historically, now there is a complete fusion between science and technology. Even though before it was thinking in terms of, well, one is the application of the scientific knowledge. No, well, uh, the way it is working, uh, the way it works now, it's not possible. That's why T is still there. The only reason we dropped it from that particular report is because there is no, uh, and it probably is not possible to do it, <laughs> to define technology as such, and it is not measured by PISA. You see, you have no, how could I say, uh, mm, nothing to put our feet on <laughs> in terms of uh, comparing between, because in, in certain countries, it is included in certain countries, they do technologically. I mean, Slovenia is very strong on that. Let me just give you one example. And, um, and the UK is also, uh, but, uh, Technology, in a way, that in the education is now used as an enabler for, uh, uh, for reaching the goal of teaching the scientific way of thinking. Because it is really practical. It is what you can do. It's not about what some 
<laughs> as they say, white dead man discovered <laughs> 200 years ago. Uh, it is about um, uh, what uh, in the context. So there is a, yeah, there is a lot of uh, confusion here, and uh, I would like just to emphasize that uh, for purely practical reasons, we just talk about science now because we don't have technology. Techno maybe if somebody is able to come to a, con to a clear definition, are we talking about computer technology or we are talking about technology as overall application of science in everyday life from pharmaceuticals to mobile phones? So there is no consensus, that's why we are. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Vladimir.